Uh, welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, Phoenix first, uh, and then some ways that you can use Phoenix to uh, and, and XMPP and join them together to create some really interesting applications. So um, first off, uh, Phoenix, what is it? It's basically a distributed web services framework. Um, and it's an MVC framework. So if you are familiar with MVC, we have models, views, and controllers. It's a great way of separating your code into nice organized bits. Um, we borrow a lot of things from the Rails uh, community, um, as pretty much most of the core contributors on the team were we come from a Rails background, so um, we take what we like from the Rails uh, community and we're trying to apply some of those things that work really well to a web framework in Elixir. Um, so we have WebSockets all built in and bundled, um, which is really nice. So you can take advantage of real-time events coming through your system. And one of the biggest things uh, for Phoenix, uh, as well as even within Elixir, is that you don't get any productivity sacrifices for, for performance. And obviously, the uh, reverse of that is no performance sacrifices for productivity. So we want to provide a nice DSL for you to, to work with that makes things very productive, fast, but also leveraging the Erlang ecosystem to give you nice efficiency and performance. So, I'm kind of going to just go through and show you how to install everything and then break down all of the bits and components that make up Phoenix and how it works. So you install it, you clone the, the Git repository, CD into the directory, and just uh, get the dependencies, compile it, and then run this uh, command called phoenix.new and give it a directory, which will generate your application. Um, so what that looks like is this. It creates all the files. It asks you some questions for installing uh, different dependencies. We have the option of installing uh, Brunch.io, which is uh, an, it's an NPM node uh, package that allows you to build your assets, so your static assets like JavaScripts and CSS and things like that. So it's an optional dependency, um, but it makes building your uh, front end assets really nice. So next steps would be to CD into your application and run mix phoenix.server, which will give you a nice uh, landing page for you to start with. <clears throat> so of course, that's not really an application yet. So um, I'm going to introduce to you some things that we have, which are called generators. And generators allow you to scaffold out an application very, very quickly. Um, it, this concept comes from the Rails community, um, where you can just run, run some commands and have the framework generate code for you, and you can move on from there. And it really allows you to build applications very quickly, especially if you're prototyping, and you just want to get off the ground and start running. Um, and it's also good for people starting out who don't know, you know, not really familiar with the patterns. You can generate scaffolding to see kind of what uh, these patterns look like, and then you can move on from there. Um, so uh, Phoenix ships with Ecto, um, which is a database library that uh, is really, really awesome. And so out of the box, you get um, mixed tasks for Ecto. And so one of the first things you want to run is mix Ecto create, which will actually create your database for your application. Um, and by default, it'll just use Postgres. So if you have that installed, then everything will just work. Um, and then Phoenix comes with these different generators as well. So we have Phoenix Gen HTML, which will generate your model, which will also include your database migrations. Um, it'll give you a controller, your views, and all of your templates to actually have full CRUD inter interaction. Um, other, other things would be just if you want to generate a model, you can do that, and so forth. Um, so if we wanted to create a blog, we would create a post model. So we'd say mix Phoenix gen HTML, and we'd give it the model name, which would be post, and then the table name, which is uh, pluralized of the, of the model and we give it the properties that we want. So we want a title, which defaults to a string. We'd have a body, which would be of type text. And then we'd have an author ID, 
which would be an integer. We run that, and it'll generate all the code for us, and then it gives us some nice messages to say, hey, stick this in your router, um, and then that way it'll generate the routes for you. And then you'll run mix ecto migrate, which will actually migrate the database. So migrations, this is what that looks like for ecto. Um, this change function, when you say mix ecto migrate, it actually runs the change zero function. Um, and in this, we have a nice DSL that allows you to create a table. Um, so we create table posts, and we want to add these columns here. And then timestamps will automatically generate uh, inserted at and updated at fields in your database. <clears throat> and after you migrate, it creates the table and all that good stuff. And then we can run Phoenix server again. And now if we go to the posts slash posts uh, URL, we get a list of our <laughs> posts. Since we don't have anything yet, we can click the new button. And if we fill out the form, you have a title, a body, and then say we have we leave out the author. Um, you submit the form, you'll actually get your errors on the page automatically, um, which are validation errors, because the author ID can't be blank since it's a required field. Um, submitting the form again with the appropriate stuff filled out, you'll now be redirected back to your index page, which you'll have a list of your posts with full show, edit, destroy, and of course you're seeing the index action right now. So out of the box, you get really nice CRUD actions. Create, read, update, destroy automatically. Um, we also ship, um, this, this is actually provided by the plug uh, library, which is what Phoenix is built on top of. And plug is basically a uh, middleware uh, library that sits on top of Cowboy. Um, it's actually it's a uh, web server kind of abstraction, so uh, you can actually provide your own adapter for other uh, web servers like LE or any others. But right now, Cowboy is the only one that we have. Um, but uh, we ha also have uh, pretty error pages because of that with, within Plug. So it gives you stack trace right in the browser. It can show you where your errors are coming from, and you can go down and dive in and find out where you're having problems. So models, models represent the database um, interaction with your application. And this comes from Ecto, which is a fantastic library um, that just basically works with, uh, with Phoenix now. So um, you can tell it your, uh, your schema, and you can define validations and things like that within these change sets. But we'll, well, that, this could probably have its own talk on its own. So. Um, we'll skip it for now. So the router, um, the router provides routing to uh, from HTTP verbs and your resources to modules that will handle the actual business logic. Um, your typical router looks somewhat like this. We have an awesome feature called pipelines, which pipelines allow you to build up um, basically uh, interact or transformations of, of your data, of your connection that's coming in. You can say, uh, you know, we have pipe, pipeline browser, which automatically will say we're going to accept HTML, which works with the accept headers. Um, if it's not set, it'll automatically work with HTML by default. Um, plug fetch session will actually uh, fetch the session information from like the cookie and things like that. And then down here we have um, the scopes, which um, so you can say scope slash, which will be the root of your um, application, and you'll say pipe through the browser. The pipe through the browser means that it's going to pipe through the, the pipeline that's called browser. And you can actually have multiple pipelines if you want, which is really nice because you can really craft uh, routes that are uh, only have what you really need um, through your pipeline. So, And the really awesome things here is we have uh, things like this resources. So resources slash posts goes to the post controller, and then it's in a do block, uh, we have resources comments uh, comment controller. And so that actually allows you to have nested resources within your router. Um, the router itself, those resources are macros. And macros allow us to, at compile time, generate functions for you that will uh, automatically do things that in, you know, will make it so, so much easier. So um, this up here actually ends up turning into this. Uh, these are just the function heads themselves. But um, since it's at compile time, 
uh, at runtime, the vir uh, Erlang virtual machine will just go ahead and do pattern matching on the, the function itself and pick the right one and route you to it. So, and this is uh, another example, but actually showing you the body of what the match uh, function looks like. So it takes the connection and it pipes it through uh, different uh, plug uh, functions. And then it ends up calling your controller that you specified and then pipes it through the pipeline, which in this case was browser. So, so mixphoenix.routes will give you a list of all your route helpers. Um, so in your application code, you can call page path and send in some parameters, and it will give you a route specifically to your uh, resource um, and gives you the actual path uh, and then the callback functions and the modules and stuff. So controllers are, are basically plugs themselves. Um, plug uh, basically comes, comes in, and, it's, and you can do stuff like this. So you can say plug find page, which will actually call this function down here before it actually calls the action um, itself. And then afterwards, we plug action explicitly to say that we want to actually call the action that you're, you're doing. So, um, and that takes in the connection and then some parameters uh, for the request. <clears throat> and here's some more examples of that. So if you're, if you're going to want to get the index of users, you'll get, do a get request to slash users, which will call the index function. And that you will typically grab all of your users out of your database and then render them to the page. Get users slash ID, you'll have an actual ID that's posted into the parameters for your uh, call so that you can find the ID of the user and uh, render that to the page. Um, so new, this is, would be an action to set up a form um, so that people can actually, uh, so that you can create a form to submit stuff to the create action. And in the create, you're just going to uh, basically take the params from the form, put it into the database, and uh, redirect back. And similarly for edit and uh, update, and then of course delete. So views and templates. Uh, views are modules that allow you to render uh, templates. Um, but you can also, they're just functions. So uh, templates are actually compiled down into functions. Uh, they're pre-compiled. So at, when, you, when you call them, it's really just doing string concatenation, which makes it very, very fast, um, which is nice. Um, so views serve as the presentation layer. So you can actually put in functions in your views to um, have helper functions and things like that. Um, and this is what a view typically can look like. Um, you can take, for example, if you have a user and you have the fields of first name and last name, but you want to use name uh, in the view, you can use name passing in the user, and it'll just re yeah, return the concatenated first name and last name. And then you can have functions like render index.json. So if you have a JSON API, you don't care about rendering HTML anymore. You can just return a map that will then end up getting serialized into a JSON. So HTML templates, you can call render from within these as well. And you pass in uh, a, dic uh, a hash dict or I'm sorry, uh, a keyword list of, of variables that you want to be uh, passed on into the other template. So in this case, it's the form. So we'll have a, uh, a change set, an action, uh, and then down here, we'll have a change set and an action, and also, um, oh, in this case, we don't, I, never mind. I was thinking about something different. Um, and then in the form, we have form helpers that help you generate forms without having to code a bunch of HTML. Um, so you can say form for change set, which is the model from the database. And so all of these helpers, like text input, take this form uh, object, or uh, take this form data structure that's passed in from the function up here, and can make different um, decisions on how to represent that field, um, which, is, which is nice. So, so channels is something where uh, is kind of the the big portion of this talk and how it all kind of works in with XMPP. So channels allow you to route uh, messages through your system. Um, and uh, by default, 
Phoenix ships with WebSocket transport and uh, long polling support as well. Um, and so channels are similar to controllers, um, but they're bi-directional. So you can send messages and you can also receive messages. And of course, it's, uh, you keep the socket open. And um, it ships, uh, we ship with uh, Phoenix JS, which is a JavaScript client that you would use on the front end to set up your socket connections and handle all of your different message events um, and stuff like that. So in order to use channels, you just plug it into your router. Um, so you'd say socket, and then you give it some type of path that you want to use. So in this case, WS for WebSocket. And you set up a channel. So channel, and then you give it a name. Um, the, the names basically it's a, is a topic, and then you can do colon subtopic. And in this case, we're using an asterisk, and the asterisk is just a wild card, which means that anything uh, you can use here, any string, whatever, it'll match on it and, and use that. So we could have, for instance, we could have XMPP colon lobby, and only the lobby messages would be um, handled by this one. And maybe you could have a separate lobby channel, for instance. Um, so. And this is an example of the, the JavaScript that you can write to set up the channels. Um, and uh, this is the new ES6 syntax, which is far better than regular JavaScript. I'm really am not a big JavaScript fan, so the ES6 makes it a little bit more pleasant. Um, so in this case, uh, just really simply, we're just grabbing some me metadata from the HTML representation on the page when you render uh, to grab the current user and then pass that into the socket. So um, we have the, uh, the socket itself and then the channel, which takes the socket and actually tells the socket to join on a particular channel, or it's, sorry, a topic. And then we can pass in that user so that on the server side we can interact with it. And then we'll just set up some handlers. For instance, this would be like a message handler in our views, um, which would be able to uh, respond to different events. So we have the mes new message event, which we would get past a message from the server. And then we can check different properties on it and do different things for rendering messages. So server side, the channels are somewhat like this. Um, you create a module and you say use phoenix.channel. Um, you have to have a join function. Uh, a join function is what basically sets up the socket connection and allows you to do authorization on the channel. So you can, uh, at any time, if you, if you get uh, passed in uh, the data, you can take that data and uh, maybe it's like a token that you've generated uh, and, be, and rendered something to the page, and then now the JavaScript is using that token to pass back through the channel to join. And you can use that to uh, do authorization from, from. In this case, I'm just doing a triv trivial thing, which uses a UUID of a user, uh, just for this example. Um, and then you, you can do your business logic. And I'll, I'll explain kind of some of this other code uh, later uh, when we get into the XMPP specific stuff. But, um, and then you just need to return OK socket. Um, which will actually set up the, the socket itself for the transport. Um, and then in this case, uh, this has actually changed uh, this other clause, join clause. Um, in, if, if it doesn't match, then you would just uh, do this one here. But the, the return value is now uh, just ignore instead of this tuple structure. So, um, And then leaving, you can also leave the socket as well. Um, and then there's handle in, which will handle your incoming messages. Um, there's also handle out as well, but I don't use it in this particular example. Um, so Hedwig, uh, Hedwig is a XMPP bot um, that uh, kind of framework that I've been working on in it's built in Elixir. Um, it allows you to basically just say, hey, here's here's how I need to connect to an XMPP server. Give it your JID, um, password, and um, maybe some rooms that you want to join, all that kind of stuff. Here's an example of that. Um, so set up my uh, JID, the password, uh, the nickname that I want to use for like uh, multi-user chat rooms, um, a list of rooms that I want to enter, and then some handlers. Then handlers are gen event handlers that will pick up um, messages 
and parse them, and you can put in your business logic that you, how you want to um, respond. So this is an example of a handler. We have handle event. When we receive a message, um, we're going to broadcast that onto the topic that we had set up, and that will actually put the message back up into the client. So on the browser side, you would get a new message in your JavaScript. Um, handle event for presence, you can handle those separately. Um, and Michal will probably get into some more of the details of uh, XMPP semantics, but um, you can handle different, different messages this way. So um, the channels work with JSON data structures. Um, you can choose uh, different serializations uh, as well, um, but it's JSON by default. And um, we sh Phoenix ships with, um, or one of the dependencies is a JSON encoding library uh, called Poison. And it actually it has a protocol called um, encoder. And so the Poison encoder allows you to define implementations for your own data structures uh, how you want them to actually be uh, encoded into JSON. And so that's what we can do here. You can say poison encoder, uh, defempl poison encoder for hedwig.jid. Um, we pass in the JID, and then we can actually take that and uh, create a JSON response that way. Um, similarly, for messages, this is how I want messages to be passed up through JSON to the, uh, the JavaScript. Um, and even other simple, like uh, for tuples. Um, we can specify uh, the tuple structure of uh, the eXML records that come uh, within the eXML library that I'm using. Um, so some more details on the channels. Um, so when we call join in this case, this is setting up Hedwig in a channel. Um, we call a client, which calls this function, which will say uh, find or start client based off this user data. Um, and then we will take the socket that we get from the function, and we will assign the socket, uh, assign on the socket the client that we get so that we can have access to it later. Uh, and then we're also just going to assign the user into the socket as well. Um, and handle in just basically uses a function called send stanza, which will send uh, the stanza through the Hedwig client itself. Um, so it just goes straight out TCP to the XMPP server um, without any other problems. So find or start client would um, try to find uh, a current process of like a Hedwig client that's already running. Um, in case like you disconnected and you needed to, when you reconnect, you can just find the original uh, client that you had before. And so we can just return the PID. Um, and then we start the client, which takes a user spec or a client spec, which is basically that configuration that I showed earlier. So it just uh, you specify your Jabber identi identifier, um, your password, and all that good stuff. And in this case, um, the password, we're just doing a one-time password and using a module on like uh, Mongoose IM has a really cool uh, eJabberD uh, auth, HTTP auth or something like that, right? So you can actually call um, over the wire to check on uh, passwords and things like that for users. Um, and so this would just be like a one-time password use case. Um, so a couple of different things that you can do. Um, there's so many different ways that you can really kind of set up these systems. And so Mihao and I have been talking about all these different use cases and scenarios. Um, and we're trying to figure out really kind of the best way to do this. Um, but I don't know if there's any like one you know, best way. Um, it kind of just depends on your situation. Um, and so in this case, um, what I have is I have everything running in a single VM. Uh, Mongoose IM, you can uh, install it as a dependency um, because it's an OTP compliant application. So I can just install it as a dependency in my Elixir application and <clears throat> set, set all this up in a single VM. So at some point, uh, the Hedwig can actually call directly uh, using Erlang to uh, talk to the XMPP server without uh, sending uh, different other messages and things. So you can do other things other than just mess the messaging portion for the particular client. Um, so you could like 
do regis uh, registration of users. Um, you could provide a form on your web page that allows people to sign up, you know, for instance, and they could type in their you know, username and a password, and then it goes and registers it directly into the server. So um, different things like that. There's obviously a lot of other things you could do with it. Um, but then also, um, this also allows you to interact with the Internet of Things. Um, and you can have other, uh, other things connecting via XMPP to the uh, XMPP server and interacting with, within chat rooms and things like that. Um, and you can have wire up handlers that will take and process those messages that are coming in and do interesting things with them. Um, so I think I have a quick demo um, that I can show of this kind of an action. And I'll, I'll have to, uh, maybe not. I'll just show this real quick. I just wired this up pretty, pretty quickly um, so that I can, on this web page, I can click here and join this, this chat room. Um, and in another tab, I have, uh, I have a, a, a Hedwig bot that's just on its own. It's called, I, I call him Alfred. And uh, Alfred just basically has some commands that I can send to him. Um, and so I can say things like, you know, I'm, uh, I'm tired. And when, when people say they're tired, then Alfred says pansy. So, um, and you can do things like say, yes, great success. And he'll send you a link to a Borat video or something like that saying, you know, great success. Um, so those are some, obviously, less useful things that you can do. Um, but you can also do things like uh, ask, ask for help. And Alfred will give you a list of all the things that you can do with him. Some of these are actually tied into uh, some stuff that I set up for work where um, we actually have like our staging servers and QA servers that we can, uh, uh, on our team, we can kind of reserve for, for, uh, for each other and say like, hey, I'm taking staging because I need to test this feature. And so we can actually um, keep all that stuff going. Um, and of course, there's like Alfred ping. Uh, so you can make sure that he's actually online and stuff like that, which presence will give you that uh, and that stuff. But, um, but with that, um, I'm going to pass it off to Michal. And he's going to tell us a little bit more details about XMPP and things that you can do with it directly. OK. Does it work? Yep. All right, good. Yep, so we already had a, a short demo. Um, I would like to first inspire you. So what kind of applications are we talking about? What is it that we will want to build in the near future? And so I borrowed some uh, slides from Ericsson, who produced a very interesting video named The Social Web of Things. And in this video, they have an application similar to what you just saw, presented by Sony, where you have a, a chat. You are the landlord, the owner of the flat, so you appear in this chat, but also all your things appear in this chat. So imagine that you actually log off from your office, you close down um, your computer, and then the things at your home, they actually realize, ooh, David is heading home. And David is having a date in the evening. So he wants to impress the lady. So he, there will be some cooking. And so Owen is preparing itself. And those things, they start to chat with each other. There are some gossips at the house. And so Cook Top also says that, all right, I'll be here in standby mode. Microwave says, ooh. If we want to impress a guest, then probably I have this evening off, right? 
And it continues, those, those things, they continue chatting as you would do on a, on a group chat. So now the carpet says that, all right, there must be some cleaning. It has been quite some time since last cleaning. <coughs> cleaning. So vacuum cleaner says, all right, let me just check with the electricity provider and so that I can negotiate a good price. So it got some good price, so it can use some watts, few watts of energy to do the vacuum cleaning. And now the washing machine says, hey, 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 so we have some cheap electricity. Fine, I'm going to do the laundry. Excellent. Do. Go for it. And then umbrella says, oh, gosh. There was the likelihood of having rain was like, you see, 76%. And the guy didn't take me with him. I'm still here. So what's going to happen is probably David will be really upset. He will be wet. He will be angry. So the things say, let's cheer him up, all right? So Hi-Fi says, all right, I'm going to download his favorite music. But that's not good enough. TV says, no, no, let's order some good game, right? So some football game for tonight. This will cheer him up. All right, good. And so this conversation continues and continues. Those things will talk to each other. This is really what is going to happen. So the challenge here is how to make applications for home that will help you human beings interact with your things. Now, we have heard the talk in the morning, the keynote talk, that there's a lot to do in this space. But the, the value proposition that Sony and me are trying to, to bring here to the table is that actually there are already existing technologies that you can use, which are open source, open standards, proven because they've been for like years in use. And so you may want to actually take your things. I have quite a few with me. I, for example, have my Raspberry Pi. I bet that some of you have ordered Raspberry Pi some years ago. You boot it. You saw that actually this does boot. And then you didn't really know what to do with it, right? <laughs> so now is the time that you dust it off and you start playing with this. This is really cool stuff. If this is too big, then you can have one of those Intel Edison computers. This is insanely small. And it has a dual core. So hmm, Erlang SMP support is there. Anyway, so what I would like to say here is that if we take what Sony described, which is a good established method of working with web, web applications, we connect them through the concept of channels to some distributed systems like XMPP systems, that a lot of interesting interactions can be done. So the web of things that we are going to present here is based on XMPP, on IP networks. It might be that we will not use only IP networks, but for the time being, IP seems to be working fine, as I, far as I can tell. So HTTP, WebSockets, whatever you can transmit over IP. And of course, we don't want all of this wiring that I have here on my table. So there will be lots of different wireless technologies. Wi-Fi, everybody knows the Wi-Fi. But we could also have beacons. So beacons is the Bluetooth low energy. Uh, we could have also NFC stickers. And it's easy to actually, well, this is an NFC sticker on my Raspberry Pi. You can actually put some data on it if you want. So before I go to some demoing, I would like to explain quickly XMPP. How many of you are familiar with XMPP already? Quite a lot, thank you. All right, I will not go into details. I will just say that this is an open standard. So you can go to the XMPP.org and check it out. It's secure, it provides some encryption, provides some other interesting features which uh, make it almost spam-free network. Flexible, it's based on XML. Uh, there were times when XML was popular. <laughs> XML is really extensible. It really is. So it's not a bad thing to have XML here. And it is decentralized. I think this is like a really, really good thing to have. Because there are lots of different open standards of protocols, but this one is decentralized. What it means is that you can actually federate between several domains. This is, this is really something cool, because when I can have my Internet of Things server at my home. Each one of you can have your own XMPP well, server, of, server of things at home. And some of our things can talk to each other. <coughs> All right. 
and it's proven. I mean, proven as in we've been using this for years. Um, there is lots of projects that uh, start as an XMPP project. There are some established software libraries, both on the server side and the client side, which is good. Mangus.im is one of them. Mangus.im is an XMPP server implementation, which has been used already in quite a few um, installations. Where we designed it for high volume, so this is uh, the focus of Mangus.im. Um, it's scalable, so it powers some quite large installations around the world, uh, which have to scale to millions of online users. Millions of online users. And recently, we've also had quite a lot of features which um, help it work in a mobile environments. Mobile as in mobile network, mobile phones, mobile users who are always on the go. But that's, that's what it is today. We would like to bring it to the next level. Um, and this is why we are actually teaming up with Phoenix and Elixir community to not only provide a well-established XMPP server implementation, but to also allow people to develop Web of Things applications, which will be a mix of what we know today as a web application and of something that is still unknown, because not many people have built Internet of Things applications. Mangus.im is an open source project. So you can download it from uh, GitHub or from Erlang Solutions website. And here, what I would like to present, if this appears OK, is how this could look like. As, as Sony said, it's not like there's one way of doing this. Uh, but I will show you some, something I have here. OK. Something doesn't really work well. Let's see. You can barely see what I have here, but that's OK. I'll try to rearrange those screens rightly. Mm. OK. What I have here, you can barely see it, unfortunately. But um, it's, it's a multi-user chat. So I'm using one of uh, Mac clients for XMPP, Adium, Adium. And here is a room in which we have two people, or well, actually one person and one thing in the room. It says MacBook here, and then it says NFC Reader. An NFC reader happens to be connected to this Raspberry Pi I have here. So NFC reader, if we take some NFC sticker, will send us an ID of the sticker. You could, for example, have this ID already saved somewhere so that you can connect it to some name. This is, for example, a badge from one of the conferences. And it goes with a sticker. You put it here. And it says, Michal. So, OK, this is not the rocket science. But what I'm trying to prove here is that XMPP as a general purpose transportation layer, which solves a lot of different communication patterns, can help us start to experiment with different interactions that um, will just inspire you to bring new applications to the market, new Web of Things applications. I have also some other toys here. For example, I wanted to show you some uh, beacon traffic. But when you turn on beacon uh, here in this room, there's so much traffic going on that this is, this is something that you cannot really read. So I'm going to skip the Bluetooth Low Energy demo. Um, and I think I will, I will conclude here. If anyone is interested in looking closer to what we have here, what things we have on the table, you are invited to join us right after this talk. There is still a couple of minutes that we can use for questions. Both me and Sonny are available for questions. And I hope that um, you liked it, and that actually you will start to experiment with something which is still very unknown land. Thank you. Yes. Sorry, I didn't get this. So I guess it's more of a beginner question, but uh, you know, it's 
seems like XMPD is, is allowing you to work with a heterogeneous system where you've got parts that are not on your end. Yeah. So, so the question is what XMPP really is and what, how does it help here? XMPP is an open standard for a protocol, messaging protocol, and it has some interesting features like presence, like um, federation, uh, or regular chat feature. So it is being used to different communication uh, patterns, as in messengers, instant messaging, and such. In here, what we are showing that this is applicable not only to human-to-human -to -human communication, but also human to machine or even machine to machine communication. Any other question? Yes? What kind of uh, memory and CPU usage are you using in a mongoose Phoenix application? Will it run on like a Raspberry Pi? So the, que so the question is what uh, CPU is required <coughs> and RAM required for this? Um, mongoose IM is a memory bound system, it's, it's not, typically not a CPU bound system. So we have seen systems with up to one million TCP sessions per box, per one machine, as, as long as RAM allowing uh, this many sessions. Uh, so this is the old good Raspberry Pi with the ARM processor on it, and we can easily handle hundreds of TCP sessions on it. Any other question? Here. This is a bit generic. How, how does like, Mongoose IAM compare to each other? To Ijaber. Yeah. So the question is, how does Mongoose IM compare to Ijaber D? Yeah. Um, it's a fork of Ijaber D. Some years ago, um, we decided to fork, um, and it has now like it has been developed so much that it's now a different project, really different project. It has some common root with Ijaber D, but it is bringing some other value to the table than Ijaber D. We believe that Ijaber D is uh, like most feature-rich server out there. It supports almost every extension to XMPP protocol that has been published on XMPP.org. On the other hand, we focus on large-scale custom installations. Um, this is the main differentiator. We install it in the places like Uvu, Grindr, where they have to run very many concurrent users. Any other question? Is there a question or is it a comment? Sorry. No, it's a comment. Thank you. Um, do you find that using Mongoose IAM, people have to change the rest? Because there's a lot of game developers that say they use each ever D, but then they end up admitting they had to change the code a lot to work for a real game. So do you find that Mongoose IAM needs less changes to work in a game environment? No. What we say is that there is no si one size fits all in XMPP deployments and which is precisely why we focused at Mongoose IM team on supporting custom installations. So we sort of we know that this is for granted that you will not take Ijaber D or Mongoose IM and install it out of the box and use it as is, because if as soon as you're trying to build something custom, something bigger, not XMPP compliant necessarily, you have to customize. So we don't try to support all extensions, we just support the ones which are most popular and very scalable, for example, adding some RIAC support or other things, which will help you scale to really millions of users, and we let you customize it the way you need it. So, yes, users of Mongoose IM also end up customizing Mongoose IM, but hopefully not necessarily because there are some issues with the server per se, but because they require some custom functionality, which is not there. Any other question? We have also Sony. <laughs> yes. I have yeah. a question on the Phoenix channels. I don't, I don't know if you know this, but if you don't match on a message, does the Phoenix, like, the, does JavaScript get a generic message or does it just silently drop the messages it doesn't understand? Um, you're talking about on the channel side for when you, if you send a message from the JavaScript to the channel or, yeah. um, so, I think the you, you know, when you use Phoenix channel, there's a default uh, that will automatically override that. But uh, in general, you should always say you know do a handle in uh, with you know you know that's your default that you don't want to handle the message or you, you, it's kind of something that you figure out how to do yourself, I guess. Yeah. 
Um, so you, you would want to either ignore the message or something like that. Any other question? How, how tight is the integration between um, Phoenix? I saw there you had um, Phoenix Gen model. Does that also create creates the Excel model? Does it create the migration for you? Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, so the question is about the generators in uh, Phoenix and the models. Um, so yeah, the, that's all integrated. There's a, a, a dependence, there's a, pro, a separate project that we call Phoenix Ecto um, that is, uh, comes by default in, uh, in a brand new Phoenix application. And those mixed tasks get uh, included automatically. And so you just run the, run the generators and it runs and actually creates the model code for you. Um, and allows you to run, run that and get the migrations and build your tables and all that very quickly, so without much effort at all. Yeah. Yeah. How, how does Hedwika integrate with, with uh, uh, Phoenix? Is that like a, it's like a plug, plug-in? I mean, how, how exactly? So right now, uh, Hedwig is, uh, the question was, uh, is, is Hedwig integrated as a plug? Um, no, it's, it's basically it's just a, a module, um, or, it's, or it's an application um, that gives you a client that you can pass in some configuration, and it just starts up the TCP connection to the uh, XMPP server and returns you a PID that you can use to uh, send messages through uh, and receive from also. Um, so it's nothing super tightly integrated right now. Um, it's very like just kind of packed in there right now. So it's not like some special thing um, at the moment. I'm trying to f work on ways to see if I can build some kind of abstraction that will make it even easier. But as Mihao was saying, you know, with XMPP, there's customizations that you really have to figure out how you want to handle certain things. Um, and so the way that I'm building this application allows you to put the business logic in your web application so that messages traveling back and forth between you know, your XMPP server and your uh, web server allows you to you know, maybe log certain things or um, filter out messages um, you know, so that they'll still go th to and through the XMPP server, but on your application side, you can really kind of do whatever you want to with the messages that are coming through. Did you have another question? I, I was just wondering how, um, so there's a lot of, it seems like there's some, some the, uh, scaffolding for building a web app. What about just like a pure API? You want to just, just build pure API, JavaScript, JSON stuff. Does Phoenix um, uh, have anything to support that um, with uh, scaffolding or you have to build that? Sure. So the question is about uh, generating um, new or application scaffolds. Um, right now, uh, it's we have the HTML scaffold, um, but we have talks about allowing kind of a JSON scaffolding, um, which will basically not render or not uh, create the template files themselves. Um, so, right now, if you just want JSON, um, you can just either do the model portion yourself and then add the controller and then your views, um, or you could run the scaffold for HTML and then just delete the templates. But uh, at some point, probably very here in the near future, we're going to have uh, it separated so that you can actually choose which kind of style you want to go with, um, which is pretty nice, I guess. Um, and then when you're generating JSON, you can just use the view itself to create your maps um, to be serialized into a JSON object. So. Can you elaborate more on the concept of channels? I think it, it's already quarter past. Maybe we need to okay. discuss this a couple. Um, so I guess I think we're out of time, but um, yeah, maybe we can talk about it afterwards.